Welcome everyone. Today we're going to address this question. Have you ever struggled to cope with worry, stress, or anxiety? That's what we're going to address today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be heard on the Edify app. Today we have with us Kara Snyder, a speaker, author, and certified professional coach. She is here to really dive in with us on how to develop really effective anxiety coping skills. Welcome, Kara. I'm so glad you're on Flourishment today. Yeah, thank you, Tina, so much for having me. So let's talk about why this topic is so important to you. I know that you have passion for this for a reason. Yeah, um, you know, it, it is a passion of mine and I think it, it has become a passion over these last few years because I've had my own struggle with anxiety that did lead to depression and it almost took my life 10 years ago. And, you know, at that time in my life, I was very involved in ministry, very active, you know, I had a successful business, my family was growing, but I was struggling inside. And, and if I were honest with you, I was on that side of the fence that didn't believe anxiety or depression were real. Um, and if you came to me for encouragement or advice, unfortunately, it sounded a lot like you just need to try harder. You just need to read your Bible more, pray harder. Or, you know, if I knew you really well, I would meet you with just suck it up, buttercup. You know, it was not the compassion of Jesus. And then when I began to struggle, I realized, wait a minute. This, this is hard. This is very real. And I wanted out. I was trying to get out, but I couldn't do it on my own. And then as God began to heal and restore me and teach me some things, he helped me to see, you know, there are other women who felt and who are feeling what you felt and they need to know that they're not alone. You know, they need to know kind of like that. Me too. I had a friend when I was telling her my struggles and, and I remember her looking at me, our kids were playing together, having a little play date. And I told her about my anxiety and my struggles. And she looked at me and said, you too. I was like, yes, me too. We need to talk more about this so we don't feel alone. So I think that's where that passion came from, knowing how God pulled me out, knowing others, millions of others felt how I felt and that there was hope and they needed to see that and know that. So I think that's where that passion has grown just through my own experience. Oh, thank you so much for sharing because you can speak to this from every possible angle. Those who don't understand anxiety and depression, as well as those who understand it all too personally, how do we begin to learn the way that God reaches out to us with compassion in those moments that we are so afraid, so anxious, and so just drowning and the emotional overwhelm of anxiety and depression. Wow. You know, I, I love that you said that, you know, that overwhelm and a, a story that really touched me and, and helped me to see that, that God wants us to bring him everything, you know, and we know his scripture is full of that, but he really wants us to come to him. And, you know, a lot of times for those of us who have dealt with anxiety or, and, or maybe moved into depression, we're afraid. We're afraid even to bring it to God because we are full of shame or I, I was, and maybe others are too, you know, you're embarrassed. You, we feel like a failure, but there, you know, I, the story of when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane is found in Mark 14, the, the version that's really spoken to me. He said out of his own mouth, I, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. And so that right there helps me to know Jesus, our savior, who knew no sin, understands an overwhelm of emotions, an overwhelm of his soul. And the way he responded, you know, he showed, shows us how he told those disciples, his friends, those three core people he had with them. He was honest with them. He wasn't, you know, like, I got this. It's going to be okay. He was real. He was raw and authentic. And then we see him going, you know, on into the garden and, and he called out to his Abba, which means, you know, daddy, daddy, God, here I am. You know, if, it, if there is any way to allow this cup to pass for me, allow it. 
yet not my will, your will be done. So we see that even Jesus was honest with God in that moment. Like he didn't hide it. He didn't, you know, say something different. He was very real with him. And, and I love that we don't see in the scripture that God came back to him and pointing his finger. You know, we, we can continue to read and it says that God strengthened him. He helped him to get ready to go through what he was going to go through. And, and he did. And Jesus went on and, and we are all, we wouldn't be where we are without Jesus continuing on in that. So that's one thing I think that has been helpful for me to know Jesus understands. He gave us this beautiful example of, of allowing community in, talking to our friends, but also going freely to our Abba Father and allowing us to see that God does not push us away or reject us in that moment. He loves us. He strengthens us and he meets us in those places. And I know for me personally, I can remember those moments where he, he met me and he lifted my head up and just reminded me, daughter, I love you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And, and that, you know, was, I get emotional thinking about it. I think that was so helpful for me because I thought I was too far gone for him to help me. I thought it was too late and to know that it wasn't and that he can use all of that for good in his hands when we release it. And just to know that he, he wrapped his arms around me and loved me in a way that, that only he can do. I don't know, even just sitting here thinking about it, it's hard to put into words, but when you experience that, it's a, it's like a freeing experience. It's a freeing thing. So powerful. It's so important that you started where you did, Karis, when you were talking about how Jesus modeled for us God's prescriptive design so that we could reach up and reach out. We are built to be relational in our moments of joy and in our moments of ministry and in our moments of need. And we're meant to reach out to others that God has blessed to be in our lives for that close circle of trusted, safe people and reach out to him, not to try to worry about burdening other people. If Jesus modeled that himself, this is a righteous response to our time of need. So I love that you brought that up and also that you highlighted the beautiful power of God's love in our times when we feel least lovable, most weak, most vulnerable, God just really responds to us in that place with an overwhelming love, that just overarching, drenching love. We could be drowned by that overwhelm or drenched in his love if we allow him to be there with us in that moment. So beautiful, powerful places that you began with that. So thank you for that. That first step would be reaching up and reaching out, right? I agree. Yeah. And I love those words that you use prescriptive design. It was as if God gave us that prescription, you know, knowing what we were going to face to, to reach up and to reach out. That's not something to, to be ashamed of that help is what is needed, you know? And, and I, I think that's so important for us to know that is not a, a bad thing that it, we all need that, you know, Galatians six, two says that we're to bear one another's burdens. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. That is the right thing to do. So for anyone who feels like I can't share, I can't be a burden, you, you are not being a burden. You're doing the right thing. You're, you're following that, that design. So I love those two words, Tina, prescriptive design. I think that, that it's helpful for us to see that is the correct process to take in, in working through any struggle you know, that we have. I, I really like that visual, that picture. And I know that for me personally, that's always my fear when I'm struggling emotionally with something, I'm afraid that I'm going to burden somebody else. I'm the one that bears everybody else's burdens, but do I want to burden someone else? Can you speak to that real fear that always attacks us when we're in those places? Well, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to trouble anybody else. No one else wants to hear this. Can you talk to that a little bit more? I know you started with that, what you just said begins in that journey, but let's go down that trail a little bit. 
Yeah, you know, I, I can hear myself oftentimes when people come to me and they'll say, sorry to bother you. Or in a text message, I'll send a question, sorry to bother you. But it's like we, we assume that we are bothering. We assume that we're uh, being a burden and, and that person is not viewing it that way at all. You know, recently I, uh, my car battery died twice in one day. And so I found myself needing help and I was there kind of alone for the, at a moment, but then I reached out, um, you know, and I found myself saying, sorry to bother you. And they're like, no, I, I'm happy to help. I'm glad that you let me know that you need help. And so that is part of that process. People want to help us, but they don't know that we need help. They don't know what all we're carrying on our own. And when we allow them in, it's not a burden to them. You know, at times I think it's a joy for them, for, for you to say, hey, will you partner with me on this journey? Or it, it helps them to see, wow, they see me as a, a safe place, a safe person to reach out to. And then that might can become a accountability for you and for that person to be able to help one another. So I think that it's a process and it takes time because I still have to catch myself from saying those words, but to see you know, this is God designed us to do life together and, and people want to be involved and be and help just as we help them. And so if we take that time and, and stop saying those words and just say, hey, could I share something with you quickly or this has been on my heart or, you know, sometimes I'll reach out to a couple of friends of mine and say, this has been a really hard day. Can you pray for me? And they never respond back with, uh, I don't have time for that or no, that's that I can't do that. They always respond back with, I, I would love to pray for you. Thank you for reaching out. And so those are some things that I'm learning. If I can shift my thinking and start pulling those words away and not saying them, and that does feel uncomfortable at first, and it takes a little time because you are changing your, your habits, but eventually you see, um, that's how we're meant to be. And if, if you can be that safe place for someone, find those, those people that can be that safe place for you. Good. And I think we also need to be aware of the capacity of each vessel that we're pouring our stuff out into and Good. know which people are safe. And when what we have to pour out is greater than the capacity of the people that we're depending on. If you have a clinical level of anxiety, you probably don't want to burden all of that onto your prayer circle in your Bible study, you want to also have professional support so that you're putting that professional amount into the professional capacity and that mentorship and prayer partner amount into pray for me. I'm struggling this. Like you said, just real quick, let me ask you to pray for me, but not let me just talk about myself for an hour for the whole Bible study, because then that's the reason why we say, I don't want to bother you because we've seen people that don't know the difference between what we should pour into this place versus what we need to pour into that place. There are different capacities for our needs, and we need to make sure that we have all those levels when we need all of those levels, not just one or the other, right? That's right. And I have had all of those levels in my life and, and having that, as you said, that clinical level, having a counselor that could sit and just allow me for an hour to share and to talk and to know, you know, that she was invested in me, invested in that time that was powerful for me. And then also to have the, the help that I needed from a doctor, the same help that I would have reached out for if I would have had high blood pressure or diabetes, or if my, my own child would have had asthma, you know, that same help that my, my brain needed, my body needed that, like you said, my friends in that, those moments wouldn't be able to help in that situation. So I think you're correct. At, at times we may need all of those levels, all of those circles. So it's important to, to do that, to take care. This is the only temple that we have. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of, of that um, in, in every way possible. So in addition to reaching up and reaching out, what are some of the next things that we need to know to put into place, really help ourselves be able to get in control somewhat of the anxiety that seems to be controlling our lives? 
absolutely. You know, I learned over the last few years the importance of having those practical coping skills in place. You know, unfortunately, what I had put in place was hiding and avoiding and not dealing. And that caught up with me from a from being a child, teaching myself to do that all the way up into my adult years. And that caught up with me. And then I began to realize the coping skills that I had, I was not allowing myself to cope, not allowing myself to work through that anxiety. So there are different practical things you can do. Um, I would say a, a few of those things for me was I was learning the importance of that deep breathing. You know, when you feel that anxiousness coming over you, taking over and your heart is racing, feels like an elephant sitting on your chest and you can't breathe, to really pause, to take a moment, to take in, you know, inhale and el- exhale those deep breath several times to just help that emotional part of your brain calm down because we know when our emotions take over we're not rational right we can make irrational decisions um, irrational assumptions so when we take those deep breaths when we pause it allows that part of our brain that can really think really be rational to say okay I'm okay Everything is, is fine and just helps us to kind of calm down. So taking those deep breaths has been very helpful for me. Um, another helpful practical tool for me has been getting myself out of the what if zone of my thoughts and moving into what is, you know, I, Tina, I'm sure you understand this. When we get in the what ifs, we're in the future thinking, right? And we're all, of course, we're in this uh, worst case scenario of that future thinking. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, What if my friends don't include me? What if I'm going to get left out? What if I stand up and share something, you know, in front of people and they laugh at me? You know, we just have these what ifs. Or we think of what if this terrible thing happens in my community or to the world? Like we get in the future and we begin to feel that anxiousness. But if we can pull out and say, well, what is present for me right now? What is, you know, Philippians 4.8 talks about what is true, what is noble, what is pure, right, and lovely, and focus our thoughts there, you know, on the present and in the moment and not allow ourselves to get in the future. That has been helpful for me too, because it would be like a, uh, like a movie, if you will, playing out in my head and the movie would end and nothing really happened, but it felt like that's what was going to happen. Does that make, make sense? Absolutely. We always try to control the future because we're afraid of it. So we put all of the worst case scenarios out there. What if this, what if that, and that is not helping us with today, nor is it preparing us for a reality of tomorrow because the worst case scenario may not be even close to what happens. And we've instead made ourselves sick by worrying about it. So we're not prepared for what actually happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That is it perfectly. Um, And then just, you know, a couple other things that, that have been really helpful. Journaling has been powerful for me. I just writing and getting all of that out that you've just pushed down and held on to, you know, I would have just plain cheap notebooks and I would just write as fast as those thoughts would come. And then after emptying that, you know, finding things to replace those thoughts, because we don't want to leave that empty. We want to replace it with truth. We want to replace it with, with life giving thoughts. And so I, at times I do find myself, you know, looking up scripture. If I don't know where to go to it immediately, go to Google and, and find those scriptures, you know, and write them down and, and just kind of replace those lies that we can find ourselves believing with truth. That has been helpful for me. And, and as simple as it is, it is gratitude, expressing gratitude is this naturally built in anxiety blocker that God has given us because our brains, when we're focusing on what we had to be thankful for, we, it doesn't have time to think about those anxious thoughts because we're looking at life through a different lens. We're looking for ways to see what do we have to be thankful for. When I get to go in the schools and speak to the kids, every time we come to the gratitude part, I'll always ask them, you know, what what is one thing that you had to be thankful for? And they're so fun because they'll name things like my PlayStation, or I'm thankful for pizza, or I'm thankful for my pet, or my my cuddle. Uh, One kid said, you know, I'm thankful that I don't have to share a bathroom with my siblings. Um, And then another little boy, I'll never forget him. He was in third grade and he raised his hand and he said, me, I'm thankful for me. I'm thankful that I'm alive. And it was so fun when he did that. But every time we have that gratitude exercise, 
the whole room changes. Everybody is smiling. They've kind of lifted their posture up. They're looking around. It's just like this light in their eyes. So it becomes this visual example for them to see how powerful gratitude can be just in expressing it in in one minute. And so I think that one can be an easy one for us to turn to when we can kind of shift that perspective. So those few examples are ones that that I have found for me personally that I can lean on. And I know we've spoken about community and 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 counseling and prayer. Those are all beneficial too. But I found these these practical things I can turn to quickly and use any of them at any moment in time. Gratitude and praise and all of that are so incredibly powerful to the brain and the soul. So you get every level of who you are working because it has a physical impact on our well being as well. So we're doing this holistic thing when we're praising and thanking and, and those sorts of things. Plus, your focus determines your direction. So if you're focused on positives, that's the direction that your brain, your soul, and your body, all the cells in your body are headed in that direction. So that has an incredible power. The brain is more powerful. The mind is far more powerful than anybody gives credit to it for having over our well-being. So what are some other tips that you would say you really want the audience to know about for coping with anxiety? Yeah, I, you know, I think some other things would be, you know, the value of getting active, you know, sometimes we find that we just want to sit and kind of do nothing, but when we can get up and get moving, it, it allows our body to get going and kind of to think differently. Those endorphins are flowing. And so that helps you to, to think, you know, in a different way, you know, I would also slightly, maybe this is a slight challenge for, for you to, to kind of look at what is your social media use look like? Because we can find ourselves, unfortunately, with social media, we, we can compare our behind the scenes to others filtered highlight reels, right? Like we're looking at our house and our mess and what we're not doing. And we see these beautiful pictures on social media that looks like others around us have everything together or they're doing all these things. So then we begin to feel like we need to be more busy. Uh, and we begin to get that anxiousness. So look at your social media use. Is that directing your life? Is it causing you to feel in a negative way about yourself? And, and if so, how can you pull back on that? Who can you or who might you need to unfollow or just there's a, a feature on, on Facebook where you can snooze people for 30 days and just kind of get that out of your, your feed. So it isn't feeding your, your brain. I think that's important. I think too, you know, we do need to look at, are we trying to be busy all the time where we don't allow for rest? We don't allow for breaks and really see where we can use two powerful words or two power powerful letters. And that is N and O. No, no is a, is a great thing. It's a freeing thing to help you when that anxiety comes and you feel like you have to just be busy and, and ignore it, um, it kind of look at it like a book, if you will. You know, if you were to read a book, there's margin. There's not words going all through the page, top to bottom, right to left. There's that white space there because your brain and your eyes need a break to process what it's reading. And maybe you need to look at your schedule and see where can I put margin? Where can I say no so that I can give my brain and my body that break and that rest so that it can be renewed and restored in the way that it needs to. And those are also, you know, sleep is important, making sure you are getting that, um, that, that rest your body needs. And I know for me personally, Tina, I had to look at the amount of caffeine I was drinking. I know that may seem like a small one, but I have had been consuming a lot of caffeine and that was not healthy for me, for my body. And so I had to pull back from that and I began to drink water, which that allowed me to feel better. Um, I still drink coffee. I just don't drink four to five cups a day. Like, I, you know, I know so bad y'all. It was so bad. <laughs> 
So I had to become a little more realistic in uh, uh, what I was was doing. So even little things like that, you know, and what you're feeding your body, are you putting a lot of sugar in or are you giving it those good, you know, fruits, vegetables, all those good nutrients that you need? Um, simple but powerful things that we can begin to make those small little changes. And over time, I think you'll notice a difference in how you feel um, and how you're thinking. Yeah. Cause blessing your body is like oiling a machine. So it works well. You wouldn't yeah. go for five years without getting an oil change in your car. At least I hope not. Right. Um, your car will stop working. Right. And, yes. and so if we take better care of our cars and our appliances and the things in our house, and we take care of our bodies, then what does that say about why our bodies are kind of rebelling and not working and not functioning and getting yeah. rusty and, and starting to clam up in those anxiety places and those emotional places because the body is part of how we function emotionally. That's good. You know, and your, and your body does tell you, Hey, you know, it's giving you those signals. This is not right. Something's wrong. Put the coffee mug down, you know? So we have to listen. We have to kind of pay attention and be, if we're going to be intentional, like you said, about the things in our life, let's be intentional about our body. Yeah. And you need to pay attention to what works for your body. Because yes. your body is not the same as your neighbor's body. And you right. need to know what things work for you emotionally because your mind is not geared the same, does not have the same past history of trauma or crisis or the same personality style. So you need to know what works for you and be patient with that process and, and begin to build a toolkit of those things that are going to work best for you. And that's why having someone professional help you sort through that could be really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will forever be grateful to my counselor um, who helped me and just loved me through the process and, and gave me the freedom to uh, be human and allow myself to be human because I wasn't doing that. And a sweet thing got allowed to happen about a, about a year and a half ago. I was speaking at a, a women's conference and they released who all the speakers were going to be. And my counselor happened to be the speaker right before me. And they did not know that we had that connection. And so for God to just kind of let it be a full circle moment for us to be at the same event, it was really a really cool thing. And it was really great, I think, for those, those women to see the power of that professional help, to, say, to see us together in that moment. Um, so that was just a really, a really sweet memory that I will forever have that God allowed us to share that together. That is so powerful. Karis, thank you so much for all that you've shared today. Are there any final tips that you want to leave for the audience about coping skills for anxiety? I would just want to encourage your audience and remind them to, to pick ones that work for them and to, to use those. And, and, and as you said, you know, we don't want to compare and, and allow the, the enemy to steal our joy. You know, you're going to be able to hear your body and listen and just be intentional in that look to God, go to him and all your vulnerability. He accepts you in that place and then he will help you through that journey, through that restoration. And I just want you to know that you are not alone. It is not just you and you're, you're not failing. God is going to use this in your life in a way that you cannot think or imagine. So just know that, that you're here right now on purpose for a purpose. Thank you so much for coming on Flourish Med Karis. How can people stay connected with you and get copies of your books and maybe hire you as a speaker or a coach? Yeah, yeah. So you can find me through my website at Karis Snyder, C A R I S S N I D E R dot com, or I am very active on Instagram and Facebook at Karis Snyder as well. So I'd love to connect to you in those areas and on YouTube. I, I always forget to tell people I have a YouTube channel, but I do have a YouTube channel. Um, so those are going to be your best places to to connect and reach out with me. How can they get your anxiety for elephants books that you have available? Yes. So there is an adult version and there's a tween version for those eight to 12 year old. You can find that through Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes and Noble, those, those big places. Or if you need other information, my website would be a great place to go as well. Well, I hope that all of you listening will stay in touch with Karis and take take advantage of the opportunity to get these amazing tools from her on her website and through her books. And of course, I also hope that you come back for the next episode of Flourishment. 